Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation uh, and the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to come here and uh, give the keynote. Um, I know, you know, I'm giving the, the second keynote. Uh, having seen Mo Ibrahim yesterday, I, I uh, eagerly got home and started editing videos of me being uh, uh, being uh, seen together with famous people. Uh, slim pickings, I'm afraid. Um, turns out the only thing I could find is someone from the South African presidency who compares my book to um, Satanical Verses by Rushdie, <laughs> Joseph Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness. And didn't quite do the trick, so I, I have already apologized to the organizers and say that this, uh, this uh, talk has to be based on my research. <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, you have been warned. Um, today I'm going to first talk about, I'm going to talk about knowledge and I'm going to talk about governance. I'm going to talk more about knowledge and I'm going to talk about the lack of knowledge. I'm going to talk about the knowledge problem. Uh, I'm going to talk about GDP statistics. I'm going to explain why I think that's a good angle to start with. Uh, but to first to tell you, uh, one of the things I'm going to, one of the reasons I'm going to talk about GDP is I'm going to tell you that we know less than we would like to think that we know on the basis of these economic statistics. Now, granted, all economic statistics are erroneous. There is an error to it. And I like to c compare uh, measures such as GDP to a bathroom scale. We all have a bathroom scale at home. All of these bathroom scales show the wrong weight, unless you have a very fancy digital new one which has been uh, gauged uh, very perfectly. But the all types of scales were always off with a kilo, maybe three kilos, maybe five kilos. But it never mattered because you were only interested in whether you are gaining or losing weight. So that's, that's a question of, about validity, is whether the weight is correct. We're going to talk about that. Are there particular weighting, measuring problems? Uh, we're going to show that the validity problem is of a very big magnitude. Um, we're going to also talk about reliability. Reliability is to whether the extent the error, mesh, uh, the error measure varies across time. Now that would be a problem uh, or across space. Um, and that would be a problem, for instance, if you're going back to the bathroom scale, if you were supposed to compare your own weight with your neighbor. Now, for many reasons you shouldn't, it would cause <laughs> very bad neighborly conditions. But in the realm of GDP statistics, economic statistics, social statistics, we do this all the time. We're in interested in cross-country comparisons. And suddenly, validity problems matter. It also matters quite a bit if someone would sneak in in the middle of the night and exchange your bathroom scale with the one that your neighbor uses. Then suddenly you wouldn't know whether you're gaining or losing weight, right? And that is very much a problem we're talking about here. Benchmarks changes, ways of change uh, changes, sources of data changes, methods are changing. So that's the introduction to the knowledge problem. The governance problem is twofold. How does it matter? for decisions. What is the cost of bad data? What is the cost of potentially good data? What would be the benefit of it? And also, how to navigate the current terrain? What do we do if, as scholars and international organizations, as, as, as journalists, uh, uh, dealing with this field of having very questionable data? I use the method of, of the simple methods of a historian or a journalist. I ask myself, who made this observation? On the what conditions was this observation made? Is there any reason to think that the observation is biased up and down? And we'll see that these questions are elementary, but very important. See. Before I go on, I should, of course, give a full disclosure of what kind of person you're dealing with here, as you have invited as a keynote speaker. Uh, on, the, on the basis of uh, uh, the director of statistics in Zambia, um, it is clear from the asymmetrical information that he had collected that Mr. German had some hidden agenda, which leaves us to conclude that he was probably a hired gun, more or less, <laughs> meant to discredit African national accountants and eventually create work and room for more European-based technical assistance missions. <laughs> Quite impressive. I have not been paid yet, uh, uh, and nor have I seen my rewards. Uh, Pali Loala obviously thinks that this is uh, an ob uh, important topic but thinks that Morton Jervin will hijack the African Statistical Development Program unless he's stopped in his tracks. 
So what used to be a field of neglect, I would argue, in the 1970s, 1980s, into the 1990s, very, until very recently has been neglected, particularly economic statistics, is now very, very important. Africa is rising, perhaps. Suddenly these numbers are worth a lot of money. Uh, countries are going on to bond markets and so forth. And suddenly it really matters whether we're getting the information right. Um, so what used to be a neglected topic is now coming to the fore. Uh, I will base myself on, on the book, Who Numbers. Uh, in that book, just uh, to introduce it to you, it has four chapters. It has an introduction and a conclusion in addition to those four chapters. Uh, in the first chapter, I introduce the, the knowledge problem, which I will talk a little bit about today. How much do we know about income and growth in Africa? I argue that we know uh, very little. Uh, second chapter, uh, does something quite unique. It tells the history of how African economies have measured through history. I go back to the colonial times where our statistical offices were established. And at the heart of this story, and that's important, I want you to at least take this away today, is that if you're asking who made the observation, it was the statistical offices. So at the heart of this story is an institution. It's called a statistical office. It has had different directives. It has had different kind of resources. It has been uh, operating under different types of political economy. It has different types of access to data. And it's subject to different kind of wishes from development experts or for international organizations. And it really matters for how what we know. Uh, and so what I'm, I'm, I'm uh, thinking about, uh, the importance of statistics here, is also a, a way of seeing the footprint of the state. Uh, re remind yourselves that state uh, and statistics is very similar words and, uh, and they, indeed one way of thinking about statistics is what states know about themselves. If I talk about validity of statistics, which often is believed to be mean directly just is the measure correct, you should also remind yourself about that, that validity is related to the root power. So in a sense what we're talking about here is state legitimacy, state's ability to deliver knowledge about themselves, state's ability to, to, to get that, accept, that knowledge accepted. And, and it's fairly, and I think, uh, a very interesting symptom of the knowledge problem that today many people would not hesitate to use a World Bank statistics <laughs> on Sudan, but be very hesitant to use Sudanese official statistics, although they are the very same numbers. And this tells you something about the legitimacy of the states in the current domain. And it's also just a very normal misunderstanding that scholars and journalists like to. Chapter three is an answer to the, to the basic kind of uh, question. Yeah, we know there are measurement problems, but does it really matter? Particularly economists would you know, shrug their shoulders and say, hmm, I have very sophisticated econometric models. Uh, if there is an error, it biases my results to zero. Uh, and, and so I'm not very care, uh, do not care very much about this. In this chapter, I show that it's not about small, little adjustments. It's about uh, absolute disagreement about whether it's, we are in decline or whether we are in, in, in increase. Classic example, which relates also to governance, is uh, Nigeria, 1980s, under structural adjustment programs. Um, and the big key issue was, should they abolish fertilizer subsidies or should they, uh, uh, should they uh, continue with the program? They had one set of data from the uh, Federal Office of Statistics that showed that f uh, agricultural production was in decline, showing that you know, we need to reintroduce fertilizers. Then they turned to the US aid funded data that the central bank had, which showed exactly the opposite. Ever since we devalued the currency, the agricultural production is, is skyrocketing. What to do about it? Yeah. So th these are not about small measurement problems. Having then convinced you thoroughly that you have a serious knowledge problem, in chapter four is where I solve it all for you, and you can go home and rest assured we have a plan uh, for how to solving this knowledge problem. At least I'll give you a, a little bit ways about how we can think about it, and at least how to avoid some of the most uh, uh, costly mistakes we can do with bad data. Why? GDP and why Africa? I should say that so I, uh, that I do not think that GDP is the most important evidence there is or the most important issue in, in economic development. I, I, I think that human rights are important. 
I think about gender equality and so forth and so forth like that. What I'm arguing though is that GDP is the most significant one. And I think that uh, when it comes to uh, determining uh, headlines and setting up scholarly agendas, GDP is what really matters. It was the economist on the basis of falling GDP per capita rates that they were, uh, Africa was declared the hopeless continent in the year 2000. And it's on the basis of rising GDP per capita rates again now. We're talking about Africa rising and, of course, the 180 degree turn of the economist to now call it the hopeful continent. Uh, so, and I, I think, so that's one of the reasons I'm focusing on it. Uh, another thing is that I think there's been an unhealthy academic divide with uh, so many scholars, economists, accepting the numbers at face value and just using it and, and so forth. While the other many, uh, particularly in African studies uh, across the interdisciplinary fields, often just dismiss it and say, it's not relevant for me. What I'm issuing here is a call for research using interdisciplinary methods into questioning data, understanding the polit polit politics of it, the anthropology of it, uh, the sociology of it, and, and, and the history of numbers. Uh, and that's uh, where it's a call for research. And I think also, as I pointed out, statistics are important. GDP is even more important. It's a very par important part of statistics. Because in order to get GDP, you need information about the whole population. You need wages. You need employment. You need agricultural production. You need manufacturing. You need mining. You need transport. You need services. You need to know how much was taxed, how much was spent, how much was imported, how much was exported, all the prices of all of these transactions. And then, pip, you get GDP. Therefore, if you know a little bit about this knowledge function, about what goes into this, you have a very good kind of angle to what states know about themselves. I should measure that Africa is not the only place in the world where you have measurement problems. Argentina, Greece uh, should remind yourself about the politics of statistics. And, but I argue that there are particular problems of measuring GDP in poor countries, lack of recording, size of transactions, uh, capacity of states, and also sub-Saharan Africa compared to Latin America and Asia has, to a smaller degree, had private property titling, smaller degree had direct taxation, all which means that states have had less incentive to collect information. Do remind yourself that states do not inform, uh, collect statistics just because they're curious. They do so because they have an incentive to do so. If you're not collecting taxes on income, you're not collecting information on income. If you are, you do. That's, that's how the, it works. And also in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have had uh, a deeper crisis in the 1980s and 1990s, which has affected state capacities. So let's get on with the knowledge problem. The symptom of a problem. On the 5th of November 2010, Ghana Statistical Services announced a new GDP, a new revised number. Uh, it was now, uh, turned out, it was 45 billion CD, as compared to the day before, when it was 26 billion CD. <laughs> Uh, it meant that overnight, Ghana had jumped from being a poor country to a middle-income country. It meant that the, on the 4th of November, Ghana was eligible for concessional fun, uh, funding from the IMF and the World Bank. On the 6th of November, you're welcome, you are a graduate, and you are now ready to enter capital markets. Uh, this is good news, yeah? Ghana is richer than we thought. But then it's also some kind of worries about a knowledge problem. How much do we really know? Uh, and, and it was quite fascinating to see how this spread in the, you know, the, the blogosphere of uh, surrounding development experts. Todd Moss at the Center of Global Development, he exclaimed at his blog pages, boy, we really don't know anything. Uh, and, uh, and went on to also note that it's quite curious that uh, they could, this could happen under their very noses in Ghana, which is probably the most closely watched economy in Sub-Saharan Africa you know, given, give or take a couple, then what do we know about Chad, was what he was uh, asking himself. And the Sumner and Charles Kenny, they jumped on the positive news bandwagon, and Charles Kenny has this column in foreign policy called The Optimist, so, so uh, uh, close to time, then of course he said that, well, this proves that Paul Collier is wrong, and it also proves that Dambi Samoyo is wrong. There is no poverty trap, Ghana just jumped out of it. Uh, UNDP, who actually delivers uh, development at the ground in Ghana, says this is a statistical illusion. I'm looking very closely at those social indicators, and they did not change overnight. So I'm going to continue with my work as before. Thank you very much. Shanta Drevajan, chief economist at the World Bank, he declared 
Africa's statistical tragedy, much to the irritation of the people who disseminates data from the World Bank, and I can assure you. Uh, but also then concluding, I think very aptly speaking on his own behalf, the tragedy was that we knew, uh, so we did not know how little we knew. Is Africa much richer than we think? Because the good slash bad news do not stop there. Uh, Nigeria just announced in April, on a Sunday, on a hotel in Abuja, uh, Yemi Kale, director of statistics in Nigeria, announced new GDP numbers. And uh, it was long expected, uh, and they did not disappoint this news. Uh, Nigeria's GDP almost doubled, increased by 89%. Nigeria also overtook South Africa as the biggest economy. Nigeria is such a big economy that if, and it did, when Nigeria GDP doubled, sub-Saharan African GDP increased by 20% alone. So that, you know, if you're talking about uh, African GDP has increased 50% since uh, 1995 and so forth like that, well, 20% of that was arranged that Sunday afternoon in Abuja. Uh, in, 2000 and, in 2012, I guesstimated, because I knew at the time that, you know, this is going to happen. Nigeria is going to rebase their numbers. It's going to happen. So I, I guesstimated, writing for African Affairs, that I thought at that point GDP in Nigeria was probably underestimated by about 40 Malawis. And what I meant by that was that inside Nigeria right then in 2012, I thought there was about 40 times the economy sized of Malawi unaccounted for in the official books. I got that wrong. There was 58. So that's the knowledge problem. Now, some time ago I did a validity test, knowing that how much these GDP numbers can vary a little bit up and down. I just wanted to see what kind of numbers do uh, World Bank report? What does the Angus Madison report? What does the Penwell Tables report? These are the most commonly used data sources. So here we go. Uh, don't pay attention to the dollar amounts. Uh, they are just in different PPP dollars. I'm just looking at the ranking. The poorest are on the top, the richest at the bottom, just to turn things around a little bit. And uh, You'll see very good news. Everyone agrees that Congo Democratic Re Republic is the poorest country in Sub-Saharan Africa. But there stops the agreement. And there are some interesting, uh, quite curious jumps. Penwell Tables uh, will have it that Liberia is the second poorest country in Sub-Saharan Africa, whereas Angus Madison, um, over, which one, oops, I shouldn't do that, never do that again. Uh, is uh, in this, the, the richer half. Um, and other countries like Guinea, seventh poorest according to Angus Madison, but almost makes it into the top 10 with the Penwell tables. Uh, so it's quite a lot of uh, question marks about uh, where do they get these data from. And so clearly some of, maybe the World Bank has the newest data from Ghana, but the panel tables doesn't, so they're still on the old and so forth like that. That's what's going on. So let's try to figure out where, what happens. <laughs> because if you look at the World Bank database and other databases, you can get GDP per capita estimates every year, 1960 to 2012. So it's seemingly there is no knowledge problem. There is no gaps. You have it all there ready, downloadable to, on your fingertips. But then you start asking yourself, well, but do they actually produce numbers in Guinea-Bissau? Uh, there are breaks in the series. How did they glue this new number and the old number in Ghana? What are they now doing with the new number? They, they clearly don't can't report the double in Nigeria and then have the old, like 100% growth in the year. So how do they do that? In short, where does the international databases get their data from? They, they get it from here, for instance. This is the Ghana Statistical Services in Accra. You will notice that here is the informal sector. Uh, I was conducting my interviews with uh, Mr. Duncan up in, uh, at the head of the macroeconomic statistics uh, safely here. Uh, here I used to get my lunch from the peanut, she sells peanuts, this woman. Um, and I asked uh, Duncan after, you know, we were discussing about these numbers coming out, so this was before the numbers were released. And I asked, you know, Duncan, is this uh, peanut, uh, peanuts accounted for in the new accounts? And he said, no, it's just peanuts. <laughs> it, turns out, it turns out when you stack them all together, it can make for a whole new uh, Ghanaian economy. Here we go. This is how the Nigerian Living Standards Survey looks like in the banks. Uh, this is when I was in Abuja in 2010. Mm -hmm. Here they're busily entering, and in 2014 they were done, and they were able to, to get us the new numbers. 
So, in order to understand what happened in Ghana, we have to go to Accra. We need to understand that these numbers, the World Bank doesn't have independent data collection capacity. It does collect some of its poverty data and so forth. Like it's a specific project, they have data. But the big macros, that's a national domain. So to understand what happens, we need to understand the conditions on the ground in Ghana. So then I'm going to give you a national accounting 101, which I guess none of you have taken before. So this will all be news to you. Uh, in order to get GDP, which is the sum of all goods and, and, and services produced in one territory in one given year, uh, you have three ways of getting to that sum. Uh, one is the expenditure approach, Y, which uh, is uh, her, uh, GDP, equals to consumption plus investment plus government plus minus exports and imports. That's the sum of all expenditures of a nation. Or you can do it all by income. All income, of course, has to be earned, so therefore it is wages, it's profits, and it's rents, the sum of that. Or the third approach is the production approach. Everything has, goods and services have to be produced, naturally. So then you do uh, it's the production, total production, you take away intermediate production, you get value added, and you add it up by sector. <laughs> First you do an agriculture, uh, manufacturing, mining, construction, and so forth like that. However, that's, this is in theory. You should just get all this information, put it together, in practice, you don't have that information. So what you're going to do is to make some, some adjustments. You don't, the big problem about the expenditure pro approach is that you don't have personal consumption data. You have it every fifth year, if you're lucky, for some countries. Yeah? Most of them you don't. And some countries, uh, there are 10 countries which never had any consumption data uh, based on household budget surveys. And there are, there are some which have one. There are some, some lucky ones which have more data years. But most of them will have to derive this as a residual. Uh, the income approach is a non-starter, no wage data, no profits data. Think about the large rural sector and you know this is very, very hard. Um, so what is the workhorse of national accounting in sub-Saharan Africa is the production approach. And this needs to be then uh, uh, expressed in constant prices to take out inflation. So what they did in Ghana was that in 1993 they did this sum. Yeah? They calculated all they knew about the agriculture sector, manufacturing, mining, construction, retail, and wholesale, and they got the sum, yeah? Then for the next year, you might think, and indeed that's how they do it in Sweden as well, you just sit down and you make a new sum, and you compare the new sum with the old sum, and then you see, okay, what was growth? You take out the prices. However, that's not how it's done. You don't have the time nor the information to actually get all a completely new sum. Instead, you use proxies for to capture change in the different sectors. So for agriculture, you might uh, have some information about some commodities. Construction, you don't have any information at all. Maybe you use population growth as a proxy for change in that sector. Maybe you use cement imports, retail, wholesale. No, no information. Maybe you try to use agriculture. Maybe uh, as a, you know, they must be related. Or you, you try to say it's, it's worth a fraction of something else and so forth like that. So you do guesses like that. In 1994, that guess will be okay. 95, fine. 97, 96, well, you know, you're getting on shaky ground. 1999, 2000, 2001, it's really getting sketchy. 2006, you don't know what you're doing. 2010, then you realize you're off the mark and you need to do this again. That's what they did. And then they rebased to 2006 and found out by guessing in that way, they lost half of the economy on the way. Yeah. Not so strange, because a couple of things happened, like the cell phone between 1993 and 2006, like uh, horticultural uh, exports and etc. Cetera, et cetera, like that. Basic stuff. So what do they do? Again, the question appears, what do the World Bank do when they have these gaps in the, in the database? How do they glue this thing together? And I, I've been, since 2007, I've been pestering the World Bank uh, in trying to get this information. Uh, according to, the, they always refer me back to the manual. And the manual says, uh, when there is a gap in the database, we have a method uh, for filling the data gap. It's called uh, the gap filling method. <laughs> uh, on uh, more uh, careful interviews uh, with them, uh, I, this is done on a discretionary basis. So that, you know, if they do not have information, more very recent data on Malawi, they might call the IMF resi resident, uh, representative and ask him, what do you think, 357? Uh, and, and, or, for instance, you don't have data on Somalia, so you can do the average of Sudan and Kenya, or you don't know <laughs> what happened between, uh, uh, this is no joke, 
1990 and 2010 in Nigeria, so you draw a regression line. Your, this is, and then in the end, you get the full, uh, uh, full, full, uh, full database. The, the gaps are filled. Um, and I wanted, but I still wanted to know because I was very puzzled, and I'll show you this later, why there was such a weird break in the Tanzanian growth series. Uh, so I wanted to, I, I kept on asking them, what happened? Why is there such a big gap in 1988? What, what happened in your database? Can I see the raw data, please? And they said, uh, no, no, you can't. <laughs> raw data uh, provided to us is only available to a handful of users. I presented this uh, in 2010 to the World Bank Data Group, and then they told me, oh, no, no, of course you can have access to it. And then after the meeting, I, I asked them and said, no, of course not, you can't have access to that. <laughs> it, instead, they then uh, uh, told me that uh, you might want to visit the national statistical offices and get the data yourself, which I firmly put in the, under a file under the category easier said than done uh, type of thing. But I've tried my best. Uh, I've been to uh, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, and Botswana doing uh, exactly that, asking them how do you compile GDP, what do you know, what kind of sources do you have, when did you last have a base here, do you know anything at all about your agricultural sector, what do you really know about your informal sector survey and so forth like that. And I done an email survey getting this answer to similar types of questions, not in that much depth, from Burundi, Cameroon, Cap Verde, Guinea, Lesotho, Mali, Mauritania, Mauritius, Morocco, Namibia, Mozambique, Niger, Senegal, Seychelles, and South Africa. On the basis of that, I can give you a snapshot about uh, the knowledge problem across <coughs> space. So how does the validity problem look like? That means, you know, can we make, uh, is, is, it, is the error different in different countries? Now remember why it was such a big problem in Ghana was that they had a base here uh, from 1993, but then they changed it to 2006, yeah? So the base year in this table is 2006. Uh, this means uh, that's fine. But if you remember Nigeria, for instance, at this point when I did the research, this is before they rebased, they used to be on a 1990 base year. That's why uh, last year it was a quarter of a century since we had up-to-date information about what turned out to be the biggest economy in Africa, and that's why you get these kind of jumps. And you see, some economies are still pretending it's 1980s, 1990s, and others are uh, rebased within the last five years. Five, a handful of countries are following the IMF rule of having up-to-date data uh, every five years or so. Uh, it's very nice to uh, also have, when my book got published, it got uh, uh, very uh, closely proofread uh, and even fact-checked by the African Development Bank and the IMF in the same month, which both uh, did replicate my table. This is the IMF version of my same table. Uh, AFDB published also the same month. They didn't find very many mistakes um, in my, uh, in my uh, table. Uh, what was very interesting is that AFDB and the IMF published a report the same month and they don't get the same information. And so that means that not only do we know, don't know what the size of some GDPs are, but uh, the AFDB and uh, IMF do not agree upon what is really the base here of Madagascar currently, for instance. So that's the validity problem. This means that some countries' GDP is very underestimated, and, uh, but another question is how do we measure uh, change across time? I've also done archival work to, to talk about the knowledge pro problem across time. Uh, and I'm going to give you a very, very brief history of statistical capacity. Uh, it is important to know, as I talked about, that some of these statistical offices were established in the, the colonial times, uh, such as, uh, and that means that many of the roots of the current system are there. It means that if you look into the, co for those who have done research in the colonial archives, you would see this very clearly, what the kind of information that was there is very different from the kind of information that is we are currently demand. You get the information on imports, exports, on taxation, nothing on agricultural production and so forth. And sometimes it structures the way we get information even today. Uganda still compiles their uh, external trade statistics in Mombasa. That's a problem if you know where Mombasa is. Mombasa is in Kenya. Um, but that made sense in the East African community. Uh, because they was the East African community, and for the colonial powers, anything of importance had, of course, to go through Mombasa. Now, it turns out that in 2009, Uganda saw, according to their 
uh, official statistics, they were in decline. Uh, and But according to what was going on outside their windows, their economy was booming. Cement was bought up for the coming what, year and a half. And then they sent some people to the border with southern Sudan and found out that they trade more with southern Sudan than they do through Mombasa. So these are the kind of, uh, it's not only about counting things correctly, it's also important to remember that we count certain things uh, and some things we miss. Um, it is, uh, you know, talk about governance metrics and so forth. I think one way of understanding, uh, uh, one good way of looking at, at governance could be to look at statistical capacity directly. I have, you know, m one suggestion to, to a governance metric is to bring a ruler to a, to a well-stocked library, like the one here at the Nordic Africa Institute, by the way, which I did some of my research uh, complements to, to the library here. Um, you can bring a ruler and you can measure the width of the official statistical publications uh, shelf for Botswana. Yeah, you will have to line that ruler up several times to get to the end of it. Uh, and then go down to Guinea-Bissau. I'm, 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 I don't know how many centimeters, but we're not talking meters. Uh, so that tells you something about governance, about also how about much states know about themselves. Now do the same thing that this time do it by decade. See that in the 60s and 70s, we quite nicely stocked uh, uh, library shelf. See that, for instance, in Zambia, the lost decades, 1980s and 1990s, are really lost decades. There is no publications either. Um, and then think about thinking about sectors. In the 60s, 70s, we have industrial censuses, we have labor service, uh, and uh, in, in uh, whereas uh, when we call, talk into the 2000, 2010s, we get poverty data, we get living standard service, we get access to clean water and so forth like that. So we get the fingerprint of what they know and so forth. And uh, my central argument is that uh, the, the 1980s and 1990s was a a serious shock to the statistical system. In the 1960s and the 1970s, they had access to a lot of what we call administrative data, the kinds of data this, that governments collect based on their day-to-day -day operation, uh, which is different from what uh, is survey data, which is the kind of data that you have to go out and collect specifically to a problem that appears. Uh, and as the economies were liberalized, as states were doing less than they were doing, the administrative data became less and less reliable, and they're being uh, asked to rely much more on, on survey data. And I think that's also a distinction to understand why some of these Millennium Development Goals, and now also the Sustainable Development Goals, is putting the bar way too high. So in, in 2000, we agreed that the development should be monitored according to eight goals, 18 indicators, and 48 targets which is a quite extensive uh, global wish list about how we want development to be monitored in every uh, poor country across the world. Now the debates are uh, rolling. What should we do this time? I was crossing my fingers that the list got shorter, but lo and behold, it's longer. Uh, it is now not eight goals anymore. We have 17 goals. Uh, we have managed to go from 18 indicators to 169, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we still have not dared to put out the final numbers for the actual targets. I did a back of the envelope uh, estimation. It's available online. Copenhagen Consensus Center published it yesterday or the day before. My, according to my estimate, if you were serious about measuring this much, it would require about 250 billion US dollars to measure all of this. If not even annual data, I'm saying every fifth year, some data, every third year, some data. And that amount, for those of you who don't know how much $250 billion, is about double what is spent on official development assistance in a year. So this means, this is only for measurement, not about doing anything, just measuring. <laughs> so this means that in year in 2016, 2017, we're only collecting data. And then in 2018, we're starting to give some vaccinations, school books, and so forth like that. But of course, that's not what's going to happen. We're going to inst instead, the gap between what we want to measure and what we're able to measure is just ever widening. And we, we're living in this kind of uh, dream where all databases are complete. But in fact, there are more uh, gaps and lack of observations uh, in this than there are real observations. To give you uh, one, uh, this is a second book of mine published uh, this year. Uh, Does a country study of economic growth in Botswana, Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia. And then talks about how the these states uh, change in political economy and the data availability to them 
what kind of development they're able to pursue and also how, uh, how things are reflected in then particularly the economic growth time series. Now, some of you might know Tanzania very well. Uh, Tanzania was, of course, a, a in the inverted comma, socialist on the Euros Nerere. Under his rule, uh, there was no informal economy by definition, uh, and therefore there is no informal economy in the books either, right? Uh, and that's how it should be. And that also meant that in the, the database in, in the GDP series that were compiled, this is different types of, remember that Ghana changed from 1993 to 2006? This is a different kind of base year series they have. If you look upon the growth series uh, in, in Tanzania, it is one series based in 1962, one based in 1985, one based in 1976, and one based in 1993. Since then I did the research, there is also now a 2001 series, and then maybe in 2010 is forthcoming. But this is how they glue the stuff together, yeah? Uh, so that if you, do, if you do the max and minimum growth rate, Calculated in international databases. This is the kind of disagreement they they get. So this is the knowledge. This is the knowledge problem at the international organization. You're faced with different kind of base series, and you have to put it together. And it turns out that if you try to put together the growth data for Tanzania, uh, Penwell tables manages to do some kind of mistake as they change between 1976 series to the 1993 series. So the Penwell tables erroneously. Uh, does report minus 33% growth rate in 1987 in Tanzania. That doesn't, didn't maybe do, go that well in 1987, but all the, uh, the, according to the official time series, is plus 2% growth. So this is a, just a statistical mistake by gluing together two series in a, in a wrong way. However, as a, one of the very interesting things that if you look upon scholarship uh, in recent years is that if you look upon books published in the 70s and 80s. Uh, invariably, it's country studies. It is uh, people who have been at the statistical offices, hands-on knowledge, they know what's going on, they know what the statistical office could have possibly known, they know no about the measurement problems, and so forth. And they always, you see in the reference list, list to official publications, yeah? The, the kind of new work, cross-country studies, large end studies with econometric models, these are just observations, not countries, and so forth. So that Penwell tables, is used by growth economists and in the handbook of economic growth in a chapter on growth at econometrics written by Durlauf, Temple and Johnson uh, they make a list of the, the, ten, the top 10 output growth shocks uh, in, since the 1960s Tanzania is third uh, but the authors don't know what they're reporting it's simply a statistical mistake and this is uh, symptomatic of what happens when the distance between what is being observed and who's doing the observation is ever increasing. And we're relying more and more on these data which we perceive to be valid, but in fact they're not. Uh, so the implication for the growth evidence is that any ranking of African countries according to GDP is going to be misleading. You could not compare Ghana to Nigeria before Nigeria rebased and so forth. Uh, any statement of growth of a short or medium term is likely to be affected. And it also means that very recent growth data is likely to be overestimated. Yes, there is more transactions going on now. We don't know how it relates to the unrecorded part of the economy. And the official growth estimates coming out right now are, are grossly overstated. Uh, but at the same time, GDP per capita in some countries are also underestimated. Then to the governance problem, some policy and evidence. So. According, as far as I know, a policy is best defined as a course or a principle of action adopted or proposed by an organization or individual. And then, you know, as opposed to Mo Ibrahim yesterday defined uh, governance as uh, the ability to deliver public goods, I, I'd rather go for a more narrow definition saying that it's where the rules are followed. Um, simple as that. So that means that when you're talking about governance, you're talking about whether rules are followed, and that means whether policy are implemented as stated and very often in order to, to get any gauge about whether people are doing what they're saying to do they, they, they rely on a signal which is often statistics saying that if this and this happen we will do it and, and so forth and that's why we, we talk about evidence based policy a policy that is based on a factual statement about the world or res result based management as well related to this as uh, was introduced 
So we have the policy circle then ideally where you have, you know, you have a problem. So you collect some evidence. Uh, then the statistical office disseminate this evidence. This then becomes a, a, a basis for a formulation of policy. Then you collect evidence again and then you reformulate or continue our board policy. That's the idea, right? Uh, the problem is that in practice, uh, this is not that straightforward. Sometimes there are not, uh, if you look upon, uh, as I said, uh, in order to have any evidence-based policy, first of all, you would need some kind of evidence. And I think it's quite a, a, a good kind of a link towards uh, understanding governance is to look upon uh, what kind of evidence you have there. Uh, lack of data very often means a lack of policy. So for instance, when you see a uh, lack of data on agricultural for food production, like you would see in Sierra Leone, for instance, no, no serious data there, uh, there is no policy either on food production. Uh, and, and so that means that in many fields, there is current, currently a governance by ignorance. Uh, central banks uh, in, in, the, in the region do not have, they do have access to clean water data, maternal deaths uh, and so forth like that, uh, these new Millennium Development Goals data, but do not have access to cement production, electricity production, uh, employment statistics and so forth. Presidents are elected or not elected on the basis of ability to deliver jobs, but there is no way to, when Yeye Kikwete is elected in Tanzania, there is no way to define what the size of that un unemployment problem is and what, what he's doing with it and so forth. It's just subjective, it's all narrative and no, no data. So. What I'm pointing out here is that when the, the funding from, for data comes from outside, you also distort the policy circle. And that therefore is ownership. So this is a wake up call, I think, for many, uh, if these countries are really rising and so forth, need to wake up that if you're gonna own your own policy, you got to own your own evidence, and it's that simple. And it says many people worry about manipulation of statistics. I worry a little bit more about ignorance of statistics and I think you know if if anything I'll, you know in the relative scheme of things may in, sometimes it's a good sign if the government is uh, bothering to manipulate the statistics it's worse if they absolutely have no interest in it whatsoever uh, but do beware of incentives I think paying for results is one of the worst ideas coming across when it comes to if you take the, the seriously the knowledge uh, problem here which I'm presenting we are asking very, very weak statistical uh, systems to provide factual objective evidence as if the statistical office was completely removed from the political system they exist in. Well, first of all, there is only a handful of countries, that have almost 10 statistical offices that are independent, but that's only formally independent. You need to be financially independent for that to mean anything. All, all of them depend on donor funding. Um, so what we see, for instance, is uh, many studies coming out now. I showed it with fertilizer subsidies in Malawi, where Malawi was pretending to producing double the amount of maize they were doing because they were evaluating on the basis of delivering higher crop production in that country. That's dangerous stuff, overstating your agricultural pro production uh, in that manner. If you looked at the, the maize harvest in 2007 in Malawi, it could only be accommodated by observing also that Malawians were getting fat and Malawi was exporting a lot of maize or prices were falling rapidly in local markets. Neither of these happening. Uh, Malawians were not getting fat, they were not exporting any maize and prices were stable. Uh, so this is again something that where you are, the results, the demand for results drives the statistical material. Sim similar things in Kenya, ever since donors introduced paying for a dollar per kid in school in Kenya, uh, primary school enrollment is in Kenya are higher than Norway. Okay, that's, that's fine, you're fine with that. Uh, okay. I think that 100% uh, primary school enrollment is shooting a bit too high. I think, you know, uh, kids move, P kids get sick and so forth like that. And if you do a, but that's just a uh, subjective opinion, there has also been a demographic health survey that find that, that rather than being in the high 90s, primary school enrollment is probably in the 70s. But the administrative data where the same person is uh, rewarded for putting people into school is the same person that reports how many people he put into school, overstates his or her own success. So uh, uh, it's very important to, to think about this, uh, be aware of where this observation comes from, uh, because uh, that matters for the, the, the evidence process. So 
what to do about it as data users. Uh, I think data users need to do what I say that journalists also and good historians should do. Question your evidence. How do I know this? And do be aware of that, you know, there is no like, don't f uh, fall into the trap of thinking that international data is better than national data and so forth. The World Bank doesn't know anything more than the state does. Uh, so, so question your evidence properly. I think data disseminators has fallen asleep a little bit on the job. I think the World Bank and others could uh, label their product, if they are retailers, which they are, uh, of data, then they can uh, label their product more carefully. don't know whether there should be yellow warning sign, a red warning sign on the data from Angola on, uh, or Guinea-Bissau or so forth like that. In the Zambian annex to the national accounts 1978, they have a very nice practice. They had an one asterisk if it was a guesstimate, two asterisks if it was a very weak guesstimate. I still do not know the difference between a guesstimate and a very weak guesstimate. I think it might be that you're tired when you're guessing or something like that. But <laughs> either way, I'm not going to get into exactly how they should label their product, but some kind of health warning should come with it. Uh, I think donors need to coordinate. Uh, there is one thing to agree upon, beautiful documents written in Paris 21 and so forth, like national strategies for data development. When push comes to show, Norway wants data to prove that their project is, uh, is working. They will come and they will use the National Statistical Office, which is often not serving the citizens, but has become de facto a data collection agency for hire, which is very, very far away from how it was supposed to function in this policy <coughs> circle. We need to take that seriously. Of course, that demand that uh, serious has to be taken seriously from the government side. So it means that the data producers, the government, and their statistical offices need to align and find their priorities rather than go along and just think that, oh yeah, the Millennium Development Goals is probably a bit of a bad news, but it's also some good news because some big money pots are going to come in. There's going to be a lot of per diem funding and so forth like that to all these surveys. Uh, in short, we need a new agenda for, for, data, for data for development in Sub-Saharan Africa. We need to put local demand into uh, to focus. Uh, this is also a story, which I won't have time to go into here, about who are using data in, in the countries themselves. What kind of data do they want? I talked about employment data. But also an important role here is the neglect of, uh, and relative decline of academic production in, in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa as well. The role of think tanks and all that stuff. When uh, GDP figures are released or unemployment figures are released, in the US and the UK, you have thousands of thousands of data users who are very educated to, to, to quiz these numbers. Unfortunately, it's not always that the case. So you end up with the, the kind of the falling between two extremes, as I talked about in the beginning, either dismissing the data totally or accepting at face value, which I think is unhealthy, both of them. Um, also, uh, we need to think about the incentives. Uh, we need to think carefully about who works at the statistical office what are they being paid to do? Currently, a lot of people working in statistical offices are paid to collect data, where in fact they should be disseminating data, analyzing data, and dis disseminating data, and not being gathering per diems by not being at their desk, uh, which very often happens. And of course, applicability. We need to do the trade-offs correctly. What employment statistics is important in Washington, in London, poverty statistics, and so forth like that? And what are the kind of metrics that make sense in Tanzania? and other places. To conclude, numbers matter. Any evaluation of Africa's development must begin and end with a careful evaluation of the growth and income evidence. Uh, without such an analysis, one runs the risk of reporting statistical fiction. A lot of guilty people out there. Numbers need to be engaged critically. This is an in invitation to cross-disciplinary work. Uh, I think many historians, anthropologists, so, uh, social scientists across the disciplines need to to really uh, worry about numbers and engage them critically because decisions about what to measure, who to count, and, and by whose authority these final numbers are selected do really matter in, in this world. Uh, and therefore, to conclude that poor numbers are too important to be dismissed as just that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Very interesting. Uh, now I'll give the floor to Lisa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for very inspiring views and, and, uh, and analysis. And thank you for the Nordic Africa Institute for inviting me and uh, providing this opportunity to give 
some comments. I think that I will start from what uh, Ina said yesterday after the first keynote uh, lecture that uh, what should we do, that, uh, what, what actually, uh, how these uh, problems could be solved. And, uh, and uh, as a first area, I would like to uh, uh, pinpoint this institutional development cooperation, which has been uh, among the instruments of, of development cooperation uh, of the Nordic countries uh, for already for a while. Uh, I started my uh, fieldwork and research work in Zimbabwe in early 1990s, and I remember very clearly uh, that uh, how impressed I was of the of the statistical office there, and uh, and they had had already then several years cooperation with the Swedish uh, Bureau of Statistics. And the Swedes started their cooperation in, in Zimbabwe as early as um, 83, only three years after the, the independence. And the focus was very much on, on the need to uh, provide data and to, uh, to uh, collect data uh, related to the living conditions of the majority, whereas the uh, old Rhodesian uh, Bureau had served mostly the interests of the, of the white minority. Uh, I think the cooperation program lasted maybe to the uh, to the end of the 80s. Certainly, it was uh, it, it was probably stopped long before the bilateral cooperation with, with, between Zimbabwe and uh, uh, Zimbabwean government uh, also came to an end uh, because of the human rights violations. And certainly, it is so that this kind of uh, government or this kind of capacity cannot be supported by supporting NGOs or with uh, humanitarian instruments. So, so I don't know what, what has happened uh, since then. But indeed, this uh, kind of institutional cooperation uh, is among the, the, the instruments and, uh, and uh, well, Finland, for instance, has cooperated with the Ethiopian uh, National Statistics, uh, Sweden <coughs> with, with Mali. I mean, there are there are a lot of examples, and I think that the, the importance of coordination of this uh, donor cooperation is is pivotal, and uh, and also uh, how uh, long-standing this kind of cooperation is. But the principle of, of institutional cooperation, I think, is. Uh, is a good one because it uh, precisely relates to expertise and twinning uh, 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 modes uh, uh, instead of, uh, of uh, very heavy uh, uh, um, research, uh, how, how does a very heavy development programs. But when something new is, is developed, I think that also research uh, uh, component could be included to that uh, cooperation. Uh, then the second point, I think oh, you also referred to in, 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 uh, in your uh, presentation, concerns the importance of higher education and, uh, and uh, the capacity, the intellectual capacity in Africa. For a long time, higher, higher education, for a long time I would say education in general has been recognized as one of the most effective tools to enhance development. And uh, the global education statistics, I don't know how reliable they are on, on Africa after this presentation, but the global statistics show that the share of population that has access to education has steadily increased in all levels and in, in all continents of the world but not in higher education in, in, uh, in Africa. And, uh, and that, I think, is a serious uh, area. Until mid-1990s, it was also common to believe among the donors that supporting higher education benefits only the elites in developing countries. And uh, even the World Bank claimed that investments in these sectors are more risky and expensive than investments in basic, secondary, and, and vocational education. This attitude, uh, fortunately, has changed. And, and today, World Bank estimates, well, again, I do not know how reliable these <laughs> estimates are. <laughs> 
uh, I haven't checked the, the validity of the data, but but the estimates are that uh, that uh, investments in higher education bring a profit of 10 percent in the form of increasing product productivity of work and uh, economic growth. So uh, I, at least I would like to believe in that uh, that estimate. Yeah, but uh, but uh, higher education. I mean the. There are some issues which uh, have been raised often, for instance, brain drain or, or brain gain. But, but I think that uh, these are not such a danger, uh, after all, than brain misuse. And, uh, and uh, the phenomena we, we see in many African countries is, is more the like that, uh, that the academics and well-educated uh, experts that work in Africa have to use most of their time in consultancy work for donors and they are, therefore their capacity to contribute to higher education in Africa, to doctorate training, to do serious academic research is compromised. And instead of being worried about uh, brain drain, I think that we should uh, uh, think about opportunities to brain circulation and, and mobility and this is now a small advertisement. We have just uh, published a book on, on the role of diaspora in development in, in the Horn of Africa, and that is one. There are also the, that is uh, our research showed uh, uh, stories about um, uh, uh, professionals who had uh, had uh, got education uh, uh, in Europe, how they can contribute to the development in their countries of origin by going back there, maybe not uh, on a permanent basis, but uh, but at least uh, temporarily. And in this sense, I think that the mobility of the of the uh, academia and uh, and researchers is is very important. And I was also happy to learn a bit more about uh, Mon's uh, project on on the academics mobility and uh, and uh, the study where. Uh, where the uh, researchers are looking at uh, at the impacts of uh, the more than uh, 40 years of uh, of uh, investments in higher education in Sweden and also in Norway. That where are these uh, researchers and the, these doctors and, and what kind of career uh, have they had? I'm very much uh, very eager to hear the uh, results of that research because I, I seriously think that also in Finland we should invest more in higher education because that's an area where we have uh, uh, competence and, uh, and uh, a lot to, to provide to African countries. And then a final word on social statistics and now I will speak as a dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and and I, I have to say that we have statistics at, at our faculty, but we are constantly in a debate with uh, mathematics, that what is, what is statistics? And there is a lot of pressure to think that, uh, that statistics as a discipline is, is, is part of mathematics, where also econometrics is. I don't know whether you are an econ econometrics uh, uh, researcher, but I, I would... I would say that most of the work with econometrics uh, uh, discipline is producing is not so relevant for development. What is important is uh, is precisely this question of data and reliability of data, mm. and it is very important to bring that to the uh, agenda of university education and and research, uh, particularly today when maybe we are we do not even need so much survey methods and anymore there is a lot of discussion about big data and uh, new possibilities to uh, get information and, and comparative information in 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 europe i there are only very few programs in in social statistics i noticed that manchester university has one mostly it is an area where you can specialize but, but within that, uh, that discipline, there is uh, this debate that what is serious science? Is it, is it a kind of mathematical theorizing, or is it really a uh, 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 deep knowledge about data gathering? What is reliable and what is useful data? And, uh, and I think that in this area, we should have common interest and, uh, and something to develop with Africans, because 
perhaps um, uh, perhaps African Africa could be uh, in the uh, in the for forefront. Uh, I would say to do very uh, groundbreaking and in, uh, innovative mm -hmm. research, just like they did maybe in just like Africa perhaps did in the mobile phone uh, revolution. So so uh, I'm I'm. Uh, uh, I w I'm, I'm certain that by, by investing in, uh, in uh, knowledge uh, development there, also the quality of, uh, of these uh, uh, statistics would improve. And it would, as you mentioned, these think tanks, it would also, if we would have critical mass of uh, intellectual capacity in statistical analysis and uh, data production, then probably we could also have other agencies in African countries using <coughs> that data. As you said, in, 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 in the Western countries, we have several interest groups, labor unions, uh, industrialists, uh, um, uh, agric uh, agricultural producers, uh, in addition to, to private banks who are <coughs> utilizing uh, economic data and uh, making analysis and uh, constantly debating in the taking part in the public debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, I think we are all very full of questions now. Um, uh, I feel personally very uh, insecure about my, my own research after this uh, <laughs> uh, lecturing, uh, since I'm working with statistical materials um, a lot. Uh, but it has certainly been a lesson also uh, for me. And I think that we are now opening up uh, the floor for questions. Uh, please introduce, introduce yourself with name and uh, keep your questions short also. Yes, the gentleman in the scarf there, please. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's an eye opener, and like you said, I'll check my statistics from now. On. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I just want to know about the uh, Ghana revision. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in effect, what you're saying is, uh, is it that they waited too long before they did the revision, or they did not have the capacity, or they just they got the process wrong? Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can take. A few questions, mm -hmm. more to the side. Okay. Please yeah. collect uh, we'll take yeah. the gentleman in the back. Yeah, thank you. Big time. Okay. Uh, Victor Adetula is my name. I'm from Nigeria. Okay. And I think that should interest uh, Jared, <laughs> knowing that we just uh, going through that. Mm. And uh, likely we are in agreement with some of your observations and your critique of what is. Uh, happening with respect to our own experience. But the question I have for you also connect with what uh, Dr. Moon, <coughs> his notion of uh, governance and by extension good governance, which to him is uh, effective delivery of public goods to the people. But for you, it is about the extent to which the rules are complied with. I think uh, the question now is uh, what are these rules on your own uh, research. The second quick one to the lead uh, uh, presenter is the comment about uh, African researchers not uh, paying attention to research but engage with consultancy for the donor. I don't think uh, that is the position. If we take the statistics, again back to you, of uh, African researchers in this hall, I don't know how many of us uh, a uh, consultant hired by the donors. I was chatting with some of my colleagues yesterday that uh, back in Nigeria, with respect to the ongoing EPA negotiations, French consultants are being paid by donors to help ECOWAS negotiate in the EPA. No one single African researcher on that team. I just think I should put that there. Right. Thank you. The lady in the green. Uh, 
There's no no other microphone there. Hello. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentations. I'm I'm Ari Miller McDonald, and I'm from South Africa, and I'm unapologetically feminist. I'd like to ask. I, I would have liked to hear in your critiques, also the critique by feminist economists. I think your first part of your presentation in terms of the GDP, um, is a lot of work was done by feminists to argue that GDP as a measure doesn't even include women's work, and especially where, where it is located within economies. And if you look at Africa in terms of where women are positioned, in terms of the informality of economies, they're not even counted. A lot of work is done by UNIFEM. Maybe you would like to comment um, sure. on Thank that. Yeah. And um, even in the response by the um, second person, um, I think the work that has been done by feminists in this area is, is totally dismissed. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I think we stop there and then we take another set of questions. Please, Martin. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on gender and the work, the important work of uh, feminist economists, I think I speak also on behalf of Lisa saying that we're not dismissing that work, uh, although it might not have been specifically mentioned in the, the presentations. I do invite you also to engage with, with my book where I write about this. Uh, but <clears throat> I think that, uh, so let me just comment that. Uh, I think that uh, the, it's very interesting uh, what you think about the what is often called the production boundary, which is not arbitrary, which is not rule-based in a sense. You have to make a discrete decision about what to count and what not to count. And so there has been a gender bias in this. Uh, not always, I mean, there's also, it's, it's complicated as well, but, this is also related to uh, what we talked about, um, which Lisa as well said about like how uh, the study of st social statistics in Africa can enrich the way we do things. So I think there is also a scope, without giving away my idea for my second book, but there is uh, a scope for writing a book called Rich Numbers, how uh, social statistics in Africa has enriched our knowledge about uh, uh, you know, s social sciences. It's, there is very many interesting things there, particularly defining the household. And that's been, so before they even did the first household budget survey, Ghana, 1960, uh, then they had to have a long discussion about, what, you know, okay, obviously, it was the first meeting, obviously we can't use the household, that's a useless definition, because you have a big household, multi-heads and so forth like that, so it doesn't work. So then what are we gonna do? Uh, we don't have an alternative, so obviously we're gonna use the household. And since then, we've been using the household. When Preston Stewart, uh, was commissioned by the UK uh, uh, colonial office, then uh, economist uh, working at Cambridge, were sent to Nigeria in 1950-51. They also approached this uh, very difficult problem about how to define the household, because it says in the United Nations handbook that you should, uh, you know, if it goes out, the, if the production goes on outside the household, it's an economic mm -hmm. transaction. If it goes within the household, it becomes a, that's a 52 standard, um, then it should, uh, should not be counted. But they went to Nigeria and realized that doesn't work, because how do you deal with that when there is a specific labor division with many females in a household, for instance? They did some very arbitrary thing, and you can engage with that. There hasn't been a proper feministic uh, critique of that work, 1950s, maybe it's irrelevant, but they did use uh, bride wealth as a proxy for the value of childbearing in a, in a um, in a, in a, a multi-female household. And uh, you know, there are still st stuff like that goes on. Like, but you, you enter into terrain when you're gonna count everything, you enter into to do, to, to difficult fields. Uh, when uh, Okigbo uh, did his first national accounts, then not by the UK office, but rather by the uh, Federal Office of Statistics, which then newly established, he dismissed this Preston Stewart thing about saying, no, let's deal with the household as the household. Since then, in 68, United Nations then did a new standard of national accounts, which then allows for recognizing that this definition doesn't work very well for, for uh, uh, poorer countries, and therefore, for instance, uh, do include 
well, do include the provision to include uh, uh, water bearing and so forth, caring like that, uh, brewing beer within the household and so forth. So gradually some more uh, activities in the household are in, in 1993, 2008. This is a discussion about the production boundary. Uh, you know, Pigou said, you know, that's, you know, uh, made uh, the French economist, made this uh, famous uh, comparison that if I marry my cook, GDP decreases. Um, um, you know, very French of him, um, but, but uh, <laughs> that, you know, so this is, this is part of the, the, the problem. It, the, the way of doing, there was a very interesting uh, report written by Sen, Fitusu, and, uh, and uh, Stiglitz, thank you, on GDP, uh, GDP um, not on Africa, but in general, and they, they talked about how should we in increase the measure. Maybe it's very wrong to make a comparison, again, with France and US, where people in France just work less, but they produce almost the same, shouldn't we? If you take account for the utility for leisure, uh, for instance, you know, how much sh should you get paid? Should you get the same amount of, of work when you're on holiday? Uh, you know, so how to value the economic transaction of not working? Um, if you did that transaction, then France GDP should be increased by 85%, and the US should only be increased by 30%, and so forth like that. So you enter into this field of projections and so forth. San Stiglitz and Fetusa says that this is probably useless because it becomes too much on projections. Now, however, that's the state of field in national accounting in Sub-Saharan Africa because you do not have information. So e even if you agreed upon, let's count everything women do, in Malawi, they still wouldn't have the basic data collection agency. You can do it according to the guidelines. These guidelines are, so I'm not dismissing that. It's a very important debate and worthwhile taking from a gender perspective, international perspective, and so forth like that. Um, and also links to, to the rich numbers as well. You mentioned the, the, the change between uh, Rhodesia. Uh, the same thing happened in colonial Rhodesia. They, before, uh, before independence in Zambia, in southern northern Rhodesia, they didn't have any uh, amounts for uh, for household whatsoever, but then after it's 63, then they have to then include because then suddenly you have citizens, uh, and so then suddenly they have to be counted too. Uh, then they wanted to include the peasants, food production, and so forth like that. That was the political aim. Statisticians are not able to uh, deliver it because they don't have any information. So they did a guesstimate of the population. They did a guesstimate about caloric uh, input uh, uh, and how much that would cost in dollar terms, how much would 2,500 calories, multiplied it, and since until uh, 1993, using population growth as a proxy for that type of production. So one thing is methods, another one thing is data availability. Uh, Ghana, Ghana didn't do anything. The striking thing about Ghana is that they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, so this is according to the book. Uh, but, but, you know, they were a bit delayed. Uh, and also when... One of the things is that you can't just go around Nigeria, can't just find out, oh, our base here is now uh, two and a half decades outdated. Let's fix that tomorrow. You can't. You need to have, uh, in order to, you can't just like guesstimate. If you're, I can guesstimate that 40 Malawis were missing or so forth, but if you're a statistician, you can't do that. You have to actually use numbers to derive numbers. You can't like just, you know, give or take a few numbers. But, so that means that in order to have, if you want to have better, you say, okay, my Ghana data are rubbish because I don't know anything about the informal sector. That means that I have to have an informal sector survey. My Ghana data are useless because I don't have any data on agricultural sector. Okay, then I need agricultural survey. I don't know anything about poverty, I need the poverty data. Then, if you, then you need to find 20, 10 million dollars per survey somewhere, get the donors lined up, and then they get their, their questions and so forth, hire 200 people, get it in, get the stuff into the banks as we saw in, in Nigeria and so forth like that, hoping there is no hiccups. It takes three years before you get that numbers. If there is hiccups, where there very often are, like a major hiccups might be a civil war, minor hiccup might be that Norway gets cold feeds and gets um, maybe I'm more interested in Mozambique instead, then it might take decades before you get to update your data. You can't just snap your fingers. It's not a technical solution to it. It's long-term planning. Yeah. More questions, please. Okay. <coughs> The lady in green there. Uh, yeah, the behind actually, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Flora Heidel from uh, Agricultural University here in Sweden. Thanks yep. for a very interesting presentation. 
I was uh, really expecting you to come to the conclusion, let's stop obsessing about measuring things. But you seem to come to the conclusion, let's measure things better. Um, Both. I, I understand that if we base uh, decisions on numbers, they should be good numbers. But it seems like you're in a really good position to say, mm -hmm. let's not base all our decisions on numbers and measurements. Or do you see any specific problems with mm. improving things without measuring? Yeah. Thanks. Good question. Yeah. I'm also a Nobel from North Africa Institute Library, and I have a question about the primary sources. I'm very uh, intrigued to hear say uh, talk about the statistics coming up of the administrative routines in 1960s, 70s, and now it's lacking due to uh, uh, millennial development goals. Would you say that it? It would have been easier to do research on the 60s and 70s instead of the 80s, 90s, and now today, contemporary. Uh, I'm John Mose from Somaliland. Uh, I was wondering about uh, what happened when there is the inevitability of data, but the genuine, what I mean, in Somaliland, for example, in many other areas, where 65% of people are in the nomadic area, mm. we focus on the only urban areas. Yes. You know, saying, uh, yeah. you know, the question is like how we use kerosene instead of charcoal, where two yeah. people use my kerosene. Very what important. does mean that number? Yeah. Thing? Yeah, very important. Uh, I think we have to draw a, a line there. Uh, the time is already out. Though. Okay. Uh, Yes, the, the, the pastoral, semi-pastoral nomadic bias is very important. Uh, and also, you see in countries where, which are divided by a forest zone and a savanna zone, always have big problems doing agreeing upon the population census. Nigeria is case in point, north versus south. Um, it, it, one of the things, if you do a population census, you have either you could do it de facto or de jure. You, well, one of them says, you, in de facto, you, you say, you, the enumerator comes to the household and says, Okay, five people here, and then goes to the next house, uh, or the uh, the euro, which means asking the head of the household how many people actually live here, and then he can say, well, it's me, and then there's three guys over there herding those cattle, and blah 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 blah. Either way, both methods are unsatisfactory. Uh, after the first, the last census in Kenya, uh, the Turkana took the uh, Kenyan government, uh, the Kenyan. Uh, Central Bureau of Statistics to court because they felt they were undercounted and therefore will that region will get less funds and so forth. So being counted really matters and being counted properly matters. So that's one of the things as well. With whether what is, it's not only about quizzing whether is this number good, but you also need to think about you know what what went into it and what is not counted and so forth like that. And here it's also political contestation as well, linked to gender as well, right? It's the same kind of things uh, that you uh, some some of these low the global standards, local applicability, and there will be conflicts about it. It's a very interesting inflection point when that happens. Uh, primary sources, is it easier to do research in the 60s and 70s? Yeah, I know much more about national accountants in the 1960s and 1970s in Zambia and I, uh, than I do about the 1980s and 1990s. Actually, in the 1990s, I don't know anything. And that's been maybe the country I know the most about, too. So, and that's, um, that's, the, that's the state of play. Uh, and, and it's also sometimes uh, the, the archives and library plays a very important role here as well because it's not, this is about institutional memory. Many of these statistical offices don't have very good institutional memory because of the circulation of personnel, but also because of the lack of, when you don't have persons who remember what was going on, then you often substitute it with, 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 uh, with documents and they are often missing. That's uh, so a big problem which I could talk a lot about. But let me then finally talk about good versus bad numbers. It's a slippery slope going down saying like, oh, these numbers are all bad, so now we need to get more numbers. Um, you know, uh, but I think it's, it's I'm, not, it, I'm trying to get to a pragmatic place here. I think that when you read my book, you can also say on basis of this, I'm gonna reject number studies, you know, or on the basis of this, we really, Bill Gates read it and he said, okay, we need to invest in more GDP statistics. We need to do better. Uh, you know, some people might read it and say, oh, we need a data revolution. My thing is that, you know, 
there are different lessons for different people. Scholars can afford to be pragmatic. Yeah, you can just use different kind of ways. You're not, you don't buy the GDP numbers of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Then okay, use uh, light emissions data captured by satellites. You know, to get the the capture of it. There are big data revolutions kind of stuff you can use. I don't think the World Bank is going to list countries by who is the lightest. They're going to do about who is the richest. So there are different types of knowledge are useful for different kind of people. So it depends who you are. I think that it will remain the truth you know, before and after I publicizing the, this book and still for a long time, that if you walk into a room and there is a policy debate, there is one guy who says, you know, how big is the problem, says the guy who comes in the room, and there is one guy who says, I don't know, and the other guy says, I think it's between 2 and 20, and the other guy who says 13.2, 13.2 is going to win it. And, and that's the state of play. I mean, that's not me saying, oh, it should be that way. Uh, that's I'm saying it is like that um, until further notice. Uh, so that means that in we in, in, in are in between, I think we need to like, you know, try to ga ga gauge what could be possibly a good idea to do and what would be a bad idea to do, uh, and and you know um, that's that's where I where I stand. Thank you.